morning. Welcome to Journey of Hope. So glad you could join us today. Uh, so today uh, we have a couple really important announcements. One, it's it's the usual, right? For a church, we rely on the donations of our people. And so if you want to give to the ministry of our church, uh, you can find all the details on that uh, at johcc.com. Secondly, uh, you know, I've let you know that we're exploring the option of reopening. And uh, so our board met this week and we decided it's most prudent to do a phase in plan rather than than jumping right in and meeting face to face. And so uh, what we're suggesting is that we gather in small groups and um, and, and we have some people who have volunteered to host watch parties at their home where you you can show up and watch the church service and have a discussion about it uh and, and so uh so that's an option one if you want to have uh a group that you're already a part of get together and and watch and discuss t- together that's also an opportunity for you and and then also on Thursday nights um i I think I'm going to host a uh a gathering at Heritage Park uh, and it'll be open air, which has fewer restrictions for, for meeting, uh, which would allow anybody who, who doesn't go to, um, to any other group could come to this. And so this is kind of the catch all for that. So, um, you should have, if you're on our email list, you should have already received that email by the time you're seeing this. If you have not, then reach out to me and let me know, and I'll try to get the information for these groups into your hands. So um, we're going to start this on Father's Day weekend, which is next Sunday, and and a couple of our groups are going to be able to do that. If you if you meet with Eve, uh, or if you meet with Kathy Hazeldine uh, at their home, they they are starting on Father's Day Sunday morning, um, and, and so. Th- service starts at 11 so get there a little early so you can see that and and we discussed maybe having a father's day brunch so if you want to bring a dish uh and and just share a a, a father's day brunch with your group that that is one option so the group that i'm going to host is not going to be able to meet next sunday because i'm going to be out of town picking up a new puppy so i'm super excited about that uh but i'll be unavailable that sunday morning uh for that reason, I'll be out of the state picking up my puppy. So, um, uh, so there, there's that, but if you want to join us on Thursday, Thursday is that catch all. If you're not part of a group, if you are interested in hosting a group, this is so easy. We got a training video that we're putting out there. Uh, all you have to be able to do is open up your home and facilitate a conversation. And, uh, and we, we want to make it as easy as possible that, that anybody who knows the English language can do this. So, um, so if that's something you're interested in, reach out to me also. So right now we're going to get into worship. Matt's got a couple songs for us. We're going to look at the, the book of Judges this morning as if you want to get your Bible ready. And uh, let's open in prayer. Lord, thank you for bringing us together today. Thank you for your goodness God, that we can lean into at any time for any moment. You are there and available to us because you love us. And so, Lord, in that love this morning and this week, may we operate, may we reflect, may we uh, absorb and send out that same love to every person we encounter so that your glory might shine through in any circumstance, Lord. We trust you for this. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.
So if you're following along in our reading, you'll know that uh, we finished the book of Joshua pretty quickly, and uh, just this week started the book of Judges. And as you read Judges, it's it's really this fast-paced book uh, where we see different leaders come up, and there's a short narrative about uh, what they did and accomplished in the nation of Israel, and then... Um, you know, they die. And and if you're reading this book, you'll notice there's this trend that's happening. And, and for me, reading this book was a lot like uh, standing behind a fence and watching a carousel go around. Because it, it there was a very clear pattern for what happened. And, and what happened was uh, Joshua, who was leading the Israelites... Uh, led them into the promised land. Uh, they conquered it, um, and, and they had uh, failed to do the one key thing, which was uh, abolish all of the, the native gods that were in that land. And, and so because they didn't do that, the Israelites started accepting some of these gods. And, and and when that happened, uh, the, that faith failure, that spiritual failure, uh, caused them uh, uh, to be weak in their faith in God. And God lifted his protection. They, they became captive to other countries that, that invaded them. Uh, and then the people turned back to God. God raised up a leader. And that leader would lead them out of that captivity into a period of peace. And then when that leader died, they would fail again and and go back to serving these false gods. And, and then there would just be this cycle. And so this idea of the carousel, as I was reading, uh, it, it would be like watching, you know, oh, there's the horse as it goes around. And, and predictably, oh, no, there goes the dragon. Yep. Okay. And then there goes the giraffe and there goes, and you're watching this time and again, time and again. And, and so we see this in the book of judges also. It's like, Oh, there's that failure. And right behind that failure, oh, there comes captivity and behind captivity. No, there comes the crying out to God. And behind that, here comes the leader. And after the leader dies, well, oh, there comes that failure again. It's this endless carousel and, and reading it in a book form, in, in just paragraphs worth of of explanation, uh, it makes it seem like this is a weekly occurrence, right? It, it feels like this is something that's just happening at a rapid rate. Um, but, you know, as I looked into the timeline of the judges, this could have taken place over... 250 or 400 years somewhere in that that time span and uh the idea is uh that it, it might not have been so rapid you know each of these failures might have happened generationally but the fact of the matter is there were still those underlying causes 
that still never got removed, that, that's, that were still left to be present among the people. And because of that, they, they became susceptible to it. And, and so um, the judges uh, were a really interesting uh, group of leaders. And they, they weren't a group at the same time. They were usually raised up individually. And we don't know if they happened successively or if there was some overlap. And that's why there's a little bit of confusion about the timetable of it. But let me read you a description of of what it says about the judges. This comes from chapter 2, starting with verse 16. Then the Lord raised up judges, who saved them out of the hands of these raiders. Yet they would not listen to the judges, but prostitute themselves to other gods and worship them. Unlike their fathers, they quickly turned from the way in which their fathers had walked in the way of obedience to the Lord's commands. And whenever the Lord raised up a judge for them, he was with the judge and saved them out of the hands of their enemies as long as the judge lived. For the Lord had compassion on them as they groaned under those who oppressed and afflicted them. But when the judge died, the people turned uh, to ways even more corrupt than those of their fathers, following the gods and serving and worshiping them. They refused to give up their evil presence in stubborn ways. Now, guys, it seems like we've been speaking a lot about uh, social events and social commentary. But it's impossible to read this and not think of all the protests going on around our country, around the world. There is a lot of very troubling things. And and if we were to look at our history, our 200 some odd year history as a country, I think we'd see the same cyclical thing. We'd see the same carousel going round and around and around in, in terms of race relations. Guys, there's a generational problem that's happening in our country and and judges speaks to spiritual problems and that's true for our country that's that's true for the world we can see cycles of of people uh turning towards god in times of desperation and turning away from him after times of peace and so we can look at the history and say, well, why? Why don't we just stick with it? Why do we let ourselves get to that bad spot again? Well, there, there's a comfort level associated with that. But I think the same is also true socially. Why is it that, that every generation has this uprising of, of, of racial divide? Why isn't this something that, that we can just be done with and, and, and find a solution and move forward in a way that, that's, that's whole and healing? This is a topic, both, these are two topics, the spiritual and the social, that demand constant attention. Because when we get comfortable then we stop doing the hard things. When we get comfortable, we stop our pursuit of God. When we get comfortable in in things like race relations, we stop having conversations. We start uh, leaning back into what's comfortable, what's um, familiar, what's similar to us. And and by not being completely vigilant all the time, we allow things to to fall apart. And, And so what do I want and what do you want and what does our world want? I think we want wholeness and healing and we want the same thing for every person. You know, as Christians, we believe that God reconciled the world to himself. There were no stipulations. There were, there were no categories. There was people who needed Jesus. And that was it. 
everybody needs Jesus and, and everybody is welcome to Jesus to share in that same reconciliation. Jesus is a unifier. And I hate it that it requires one leader to, to keep this thing going on in Judges, right? I hate it that it, it's the effort of one person that that turns things around. But, uh, you know, it's, it's a cool thing that one person can have that kind of impact, but it's because there wasn't that continuation, because every everybody hadn't committed themselves fully to to this mission that when that person died it faded away if we want to see wholeness spiritually socially it's going to require vigilance on all of our parts all the time and i'm encouraged i i'm encouraged that there there was the effectiveness of one person but but also, if we turn ahead to, to Judges chapter 7, we read about Gideon and his mission. And, and God, where, where Gideon had the, the full force of the Israelite army at his disposal, God dwindled that army down to 300 people for a specific reason. In chapter 7, verse 2, it says that the Lord said to Gideon, You have too many men for me to deliver Midian into their hands. And that doesn't even make sense, right? Bigger armies are more effective. But here's what he had to say. In order that Israel or that Israel may not boast against me that their own strength has saved her. Announce now to the people that anyone who trembles in fear. And so he starts dwindling this large army down to three hundred people. Because they, they thought that they could do it on their own. And, and so here's my point, guys. If one judge can turn a nation, and if 300 men can conquer an army, then it takes these few dedicated people, these few people, to really make effective change. And if we see this socially, now we have... That, that small army who's fighting for this change. But if this is a fad, then it will fade away again. And it will come back in an ugly way later again. So what is it going to take for us to socially and spiritually fix what's wrong? What's it going to take for us to do what it, what's required of us to do? It's going to take you, and it's going to take me. It's going to take all of us to stand firm in the things that we believe in. It's going to take us to say what needs to be said. It's going to take us to hear the hard things that that might reveal things about ourselves that we never wanted to know about ourselves. It's going to take us this commitment to seeing reconciliation throughout the whole world towards God and in the spirit of Jesus Christ that, that we can be right together again. I encourage you, church, have conversations. Pursue God. Pursue the input of other people, even if they're saying things that you don't want to hear. Pray that God uh, shows you in, in his grace and mercy the way that you can love the way that he does. To love every person. And love is such an active word. Love does not mean that you sit isolated and alone and contemplate what you think and what you believe love requires that you go and meet the needs of other people love requires that you allow other people the voice to speak into something love 
requires that, that you need to address uh, whatever somebody is feeling, whether it's perceived or real or, or anything, that there's legitimacy there. And so church, this is as much of a political statement as you're going to get from me. But if you don't see the spiritual in the social, then you're missing something huge. If Jesus is only uh, applicable in our isolation, in our own belief system, and he's, he's not applicable in our world, then, then we are missing a huge part of of who Jesus is. Jesus is the eternal truth, but he's also a truth for this world in this situation. And that truth is love. And so church, is this going to be uh, the next round on the carousel? Are we addressing the problem in society? Are we addressing the problem spiritually in our lives? It just so that we can predictably see something come behind us that that we will fall away again that we'll we'll see that peace for a little while, but will we fall away again and and have this whole thing blow up again, or are we going to do the hard work to fix the problem? Are we going to do the work now so that the next generation is not just another round on the carousel. But that that carousel gets off its tracks and moves in a forward motion instead of a circular motion. We have to have that hope, but we also have to do the hard work to make it happen. So that's my message, church. Uh That's my message. It's not a political statement. It's a human statement. Humans matter to God. That means humans matter to me too. So let's pursue him together. Let's pursue reconciliation with each other together.
I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made it when it's all about you. As I send you out this week, church, there's one word that I want to send you out with, which is hope. Hope is is such a fleeting thing sometimes, especially when, when the world is going crazy all around us and it's out of our control and we don't even know how to respond to it. But hope is the thing that always carries us through those times. And so even if, if you resonate with that idea, the world is going crazy, what am I going to do? Have hope. Have hope that there's a God working on your behalf. Have hope that, that the same way that he wanted to reconcile with you is the same way that he wants to reconcile the world to himself. Have hope that the unlimited, uh, ultra-loving God who knows no limitations in his ability or in his love is the same God working on behalf of redemptive work of this world. So have hope. So now, church, go in the hope of Jesus Christ, the all-sufficient, all-loving Savior of the world. Amen.